old warrior wiped his sword clean after what had been a long and exhausting night. It had been a rescue mission. You see, this warrior had a trained army of about 300 plus men, and they had gone on a rescue mission to rescue this warrior's nephew. And during that night, there had been chasing, there had been battles, lives were lost, blood was spilled, but they had been successful. They had completed their mission, they had rescued many people, and they were returning, but the old warrior was tired. And as he began the road home, probably looking forward to just lying down and going to sleep, out came two kings. The first king, the old warrior, wasn't that fond of. He didn't trust him. He was known as the king of Sodom. But the second king who came out to greet the warrior and his men, this was a very special king. This was a king that as tired and exhausted as the old warrior was, he made sure to pay honor to this king, this king known as Melchizedek. That, friends, is the first encounter that we have in Scripture with Melchizedek. Now, you might, if you weren't here last Sunday, you might be saying, why are we talking about Melchizedek? Are you just using it because you know how to pronounce that name and you just want to say it a lot? Yes, that's part of the reason. But last week when we were looking in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews talks about how Jesus is of the order of Melchizedek, which should, any time we see an Old Testament connection to Jesus, I think it's always a good idea to stop and pause and go and explore that connection. And so if the writer of Hebrews is telling us that Melchizedek and Jesus are connected, that Jesus is of the priestly order of Melchizedek, we should go back and do a little research. Now, I'm going to guess... If you decided, if you've grown up in church and you've read the Bible, or if you just know a few Bible stories, maybe it's your only biblical knowledge is through Veggie Tales or whatever, but if you were going to put a list together of your top 50 people from the Bible, would Melchizedek make your list? Most people would probably say no. I would definitely say no, right? We'd have Abraham, we'd have Noah, we'd have all David, we'd have all the New Testament characters, but would we have Melchizedek? Probably not. But the writer of Hebrews is saying this morning, I want you to redo that list, because Melchizedek is someone of importance. The problem is, he's a bit of a man of mystery. He's only mentioned in three books of the Bible, and we're going to look at all those three today. So, are you ready to do a little sleuthing in our Bible this morning? To look into a little mystery? Are you ready for it? All right, then turn to your neighbor and say, hey neighbor. Are you ready to unlock the mysteries of the mysterious Melchizedek? All right, well let's begin, and we just saw mention in Hebrews 7 that the story of Melchizedek goes all the way back to the very first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis. So today, if you've got a Bible or Bible app, just be ready. We're going to be flipping back and forth between Genesis and Hebrews. If you want to grab another Bible out of the pew in front of you and have two, go for it. If you want to have four or five, go for it. All right, because we're going to be moving a lot through Old Testament and New Testament today. But it does begin in Genesis, and it begins with Abraham. All right, Abraham is a name we know probably in our top 50, right? They've even wrote a song about him. It involves a lot of hand movements and arms and legs. But before Abraham, before God changes Abraham's name to Abraham, his name is Abram. We could say he had less ham back then. Uh, And Abram and his wife, Sarah, and her name before was Sarai, they were given a promise by God. If you know the story, God promised he's going to make Abraham into a great nation. He's going to bless all people through him. But he has Abraham leave his home and move to the land of Canaan. And when Abraham moves to the land of Canaan, he and his wife Sarah go, but they also bring his nephew Lot, 
which in hindsight, maybe not the best guy to bring on the voyage. Because Lot will ultimately cause a lot of problems. And while they're in Canaan, Abraham and Lot, they separate uh, and they, because there's just too much conflict between their herders and all their animals. And so they separate and Lot goes to live uh, down in the lush area near these two cities called Sodom and Gomorrah, which if you know anything about those cities, good places to live? No. Maybe nice land, but not great people. So Lot, during the night... He is captured. He and his family are captured because there's a war. Now, we have to remember in this time period, when you talk about kings, you're usually not talking about someone with a huge kingdom. These are more like tribes. And so there's a multitude of kings that are formed together, and they go to war, and the aftermath of that war is that Lot gets captured. And so a messenger comes to Abram, who escapes, from being captured, being hostage, if you want to use that, or plundered, if you can say that. And he comes to Abram and says, Abram, your nephew Lot has been captured. You need to rescue him. And I don't know, perhaps Abraham thinks to himself, well, hmm, could save a lot of trouble in the future if I just kind of let him stay. But no, Abram gets his 300 plus trained men, and so they go and they rescue Lot. They engage in a battle with these other kings, and they rescue Lot. And so, if we go to Genesis chapter 14, and go to verse 17, we're going to read verses 17 through 20. That's what just happened. Abram and his men were successful, they rescued Lot, and now they're coming back. So again, Genesis 14, beginning with verse 17. After Abram returned from defeating Kedorlaomer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shiva, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. All right, that is our first mention of Melchizedek. So let's talk about a few things that we just learned from those verses. If look at verse 17, we learn uh, that, or excuse me, go to verse 18. What do we learn? What is Melchizedek? He is a king. Now, the writer of Hebrews also is going to use this scripture. Because again, there's not a lot of information about Melchizedek. So he's going to use this very same scripture. So let's go back to Hebrews now. Go back to Hebrews chapter 7. All right, go to verse number 2. Now, Melchizedek is a king. And where is he the king of? Do you remember from our reading? Salem. Salem is another name for Jerusalem. Now, the name Salem is very similar to a Hebrew word that you might have heard, shalom. And the, name, and the word shalom means peace. So Melchizedek is the king of Salem and the king of peace. Now, go to Hebrews 7, 2, because he's going to let us know something else about Melchizedek. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also, king of Salem means king of peace. So who is Melchizedek? He's the king of righteousness, and he's the king of peace. Now let's just pause there for a second. Righteousness, what does that mean? That means to be right with God. In order to be right with God, that means you do not sin. So Melchizedek is right with God. He's the king of righteousness. That is literally what his name means. Melchizedek is two Hebrew words, which means king of righteousness. Also could be translated king of justice. But in order to be righteous, you have to be right with God. Then he's also the king of Salem. And Salem is very similar to Shalom, which is why the writer of Hebrews says he's the king of peace. So he's the king of righteousness and the king of peace. 
Now, if you're going to be a king of something, those are pretty lofty things to be a king of, don't you think? Yes. Now, there's something else about Melchizedek that is highly unusual. Go back to Hebrews 7, 1. This Melchizedek was king of Salem. Yep, we got that. And now listen to this. And what? Priest of God Most High. All right, if you know a little bit about priests and kings in the Old Testament or even the New Testament, how many kings of Israel were also priests? Let's count. Oh, zero. Zero. Because we talked about this last week, where do the priests come from? They come from a certain tribe. Remember, there's 12 tribes of Israel. They come from the tribe of Levi. They're the Levites. All right? And the high priest family, they come from Aaron, the brother of Moses. Now, if you know anything about the kings of Israel, especially the kings in Jerusalem, because remember, in the history of Israel, Israel will end up separating into two kingdoms, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. But since the second king of Israel, a guy named David, maybe you've heard about him, involved Goliath, all right? Ever since David, every single king in Jerusalem, the king of Judah, which is the southern kingdom of Israel, they come from the tribe of Judah. That's David's lineage. How many kings of Judah were also high priests? Zero, not one. In fact, kings weren't even allowed, usually, there's a couple exceptions, to even make a sacrifice to God. That was the job of the high priests. Why? Because kings were not priests. The two never went together. And so what do we have with Melchizedek? We have a king who's also a priest. Is that breaking the rules? Yes, absolutely it's breaking the rules. So that's something else we know about Melchizedek. He doesn't play by the rules. Well, why? Because he's special. He is different than the other kings of Israel and the other priests of Israel. So just kind of file that for a moment. King and priest, that is a major difference with Melchizedek. Now, I told you we're going to go back and forth. Go back to Genesis 14 now. And if you go to Genesis 14... When Abram meets Melchizedek, Melchizedek does two rather unusual things. So let's look at verses 18 through 19 in Genesis 14. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out, what? Bread and wine. Wait a second. Bread and wine. Does that sound like something you might have heard Jesus doing? Something that we still do. Yeah, say, what, what does it sound like? Communion, doesn't it? He brought out bread and wine. Now, you could argue that's just a normal thing to do, to just celebrate a victory. He just wanted to provide refreshment. But it's a little unusual. Then, when you combine it with something else he does in verse 19, it makes us go, hmm. Look at verse 19. And he, what? Blessed Abram. He blessed him. He brings out bread and wine, which sounds a lot like communion. And then he blesses him. Again, just file these things in your mind for now. Then, look at verse 20. What does Abram do after receiving bread and wine and a blessing from Melchizedek? Verse 20. And praise be to God Most High who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. What do we call it when you give a tenth of everything you have? A tithe. Oh, wait a minute. Tithe. Isn't that one of those church words? Yep. And you know where we got it? The Bible. When you tithe, ultimately, who are you tithing to? To God. To God. The writer of Hebrews, again, who has read this Old Testament scripture, says, wait a second. Wait a second. Do you see what just happened? So let's go back. Ready to flip back. Go back to Hebrews chapter 7. 
Look at verse 4. Again, about this tithe that Abram gives to Melchizedek. Just think how great he was, he being Melchizedek. Even the patriarch, Abraham, gave him a tenth of the plunder. He goes on in verse 5. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi, who become priests, to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their fellow Israelites, even though they are also descended from Abraham. Verse 6. This man, however, did not trace his descent. Melchizedek does not trace his descent from Levi. Yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. What is he saying? He's saying... Take notice. Take notice of what Abraham has just done. This is usually what we do with the priests, who ultimately we are giving that offering, that tithe, to God. And yet, Melchizedek is not in the tribe of Levi, and Abraham still gives him a tithe. He gives him 10%. If you're taking notes, you might just want a little note there that said, Abram gave a tithe that we usually give to God. Now, I think in a bit of humor, the writer of Hebrews makes a connection with Abraham and then also the priests coming out of Levi. If you go to verses 9 through 10, one might even say, that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham. Because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean like Levi was there just hanging out in Abraham's back pocket or something? No. In fact, Levi is the great grandson of Abraham. Levi is not alive at this moment. So what's the writer of Hebrews saying? He's saying that there's a connection because through his DNA, Levi, in a way, is tithing to Melchizedek through the actions of his great-grandfather. So even the family of the priests are paying honor to Melchizedek. All right, everybody following so far? Okay, making these connections? Now... It gets even more wild if we go to verse 3 of Hebrews 7. So we're going to backtrack a little bit. Because what does the writer of Hebrews say? What does he say about Melchizedek's genealogy? Well, listen to this. Without father or mother, he's talking about Melchizedek, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. What does that tell us about Melchizedek's family line? Does he have a mother and father that we know of? No. No genealogy. Now, you might say, well, you know, a lot of people don't have records of their genealogy. But in the Old Testament, was genealogy important? Yeah. Remember all those long lists of names? You know, the ones you usually see and you go, yep, next page, right? Those long lists of names, what do they, what do they say? Son of, son of, grandson of, in the line of, right? Because your ancestry in the ancient world meant everything. It was what gave you authority and what made you a legitimate person in the position that you were in. So ancestry was crucial to people. And here you have this king of peace, this king of righteousness, this king who shows up in Genesis 14 and Abraham gives him a tenth of everything, and what do we know about him? He's got no genealogy. He has no ancestry. And the writer Hebrews says he's without beginning of days or end of life. Is that unusual? Yes, highly unusual. And here's the wild thing. Melchizedek shows up at Genesis 14. All that happens. And then he's gone. No other record. No other scripture until Psalm 110, the psalm that we read at the beginning, which David, King David, writes much, much later, 
thousands of years later than this interaction with Abram and Melchizedek. And what did David say in Psalm 110? He's describing the great king who's coming. And what does he say about that great king? That he will be what? A priest forever. In the order of Melchizedek. So that's the next time that we hear about Melchizedek, all the way in Psalm 110, verse 4. Then we don't hear about him again until Hebrews. And he's mentioned multiple times in Hebrews. So what does all this mean? Well, why does the writer of Hebrews go back to a character that if, honestly, you weren't paying attention when you read Genesis, you probably would just miss or forget about? And when you read Psalm 110, you probably think, Melchizedek, I don't know, whatever. Next. Why is he concentrating on Melchizedek? We'll go back to Hebrews 7, verse 3. Again, about the genealogy. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling, who does Melchizedek resemble? The Son of God. That, my friends... That is the big connection the writer of Hebrews wants to make between Jesus and Melchizedek. Melchizedek resembles the Son of God. He resembles Jesus. So then the big question we have to ask now is, is Melchizedek actually Jesus? And you think, wait, wait, wait a minute. Jesus is Jesus. Melchizedek is Melchizedek. What are you talking about? Well, here's the thing. In the Old Testament, theologians and biblical scholars will describe what they call Christophanies. What is a Christophany? A Christophany is when you have the pre-incarnate Jesus. Jesus, before he's born in Bethlehem, before he's born to Mary, Jesus shows up and interacts with people. Many biblical scholars believe every time in the Old Testament you see the term angel of the Lord, that is pre-incarnate Jesus. And there is an argument. Some scholars believe that Melchizedek is a Christophany. He is actually pre-incarnate Jesus. You say, well, what are they basing that on? Well, let's look at just a few of the arguments. We've already looked at some. But these are the main arguments for those who argue. And this is debatable. There's both sides to this. For those that argue that Melchizedek is actually Jesus, they would say he's king and priest. No other Israelite king, no other Israelite priest ever had those two titles except for one. The one who rode in to Jerusalem and died on a cross. He is both king and high priest. So that would be one argument, that the titles for Jesus and Melchizedek are very, very similar. The second is, we mentioned this before, he's the king of righteousness and peace. In order to be the king of righteousness and peace, you have to be right with God. You have to not have sinned. There's only one person. We just heard in our kids' message who was perfect, who never sinned. The other is that tithing of Abraham, right? Why would Abraham, Abram, why would he tithe to Melchizedek unless he recognized that Melchizedek was divine? The big one is that whole line that the writer of Hebrews talks about over and over again, the order of Melchizedek. Now, when we talk about the order of the Levites, the order of Aaron, you can trace it. Right? Father, son, 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 son. Melchizedek, are there any sons? No. And so the argument is, how could there be an order of Melchizedek when there's no lineage? And the answer that these biblical scholars would say is, because it's been the same one guy. The order is because it's been Jesus the whole time. Also, in that argument is the fact that the writer of Hebrews says, That Melchizedek has no beginning, no end. He has no genealogy. He doesn't have a genealogy because he was there. 
from the very beginning? Well, if you know the creation story, the only ones who are there from the very beginning are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So, those are the arguments that Melchizedek is what we call a Christophany. Now, again, this is highly debatable. And you are very much entitled to your opinion on either side of this. I'm not here to sway you either way. So what are the arguments against Melchizedek being Jesus? Well, these scholars would say he's an actual recorded person. They recorded him in scripture because he existed. He was a king of Salem. They also will say that the writer of Hebrews is speaking figuratively, not literally, when he says that Melchizedek resembles Jesus. He's not actually saying he's Jesus. He's saying he resembles Jesus. And again, when he says no genealogy, that's just figurative because there's no recorded genealogy. It's not literal. They would also argue that this is different than other Old Testament theophanies. All right, Christophany is when Jesus, pre-incarnate Jesus, is present. Theophany is the presence of God. And they would say in other cases in the Old Testament where God is present, you will see a lot more acknowledgement from the people of the divine. Right? Remember Moses? When Moses sees the burning bush, does he just say, hey, how you doing? No, what does he do? He falls on the ground. So they would say, this is a little different. Abram doesn't seem to fall on the ground. There is also, and we don't have time to get into all this, there is also a belief, not as widely uh, spread, but there's a belief that Melchizedek is actually a son of Noah. Remember, Noah had three sons? They believe that it's his son, Shem. Because if you look at Shem's lifespan, he would actually be living at the same time as Abraham. Now, we're not going to go down that road because that's going to be a whole bunch more stuff. But these are all arguments to say, no, Melchizedek was actually a real person, and the writer of Hebrews is just making a comparison, showing there's some similarities, but he's not actually Jesus. Again, you are welcome to choose whichever one you want, and you're going to find scholars and articles and research that would show both sides. But the big question, now that we have... Learn more about Melchizedek than you probably knew, and maybe you ever wanted to know. The big question is, why is any of this important to us? Besides kind of nerding out on the Bible this morning, why is any of this important? What does this matter to us? Right? Melchizedek, Jesus, okay, I can see both sides of the argument, but why is this important to us? The writer of Hebrews anticipates our question. Go to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. So it's a little bit further than what we just read. The writer of Hebrews says in verse 11, If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. Do you understand what he's saying there? He's saying, for years and years and years, the system has been, the priests are all Levites from the tribe of Levi, and they're the ones who lead the worship at the temple. They're the ones making the sacrifices. If that system has been perfect, then why does God need to send another high priest. If there was nothing wrong with it, why would God still send someone outside of the system? Go to verses 18 through 19 of Hebrews 7. The former regulation is set aside so that former system of the temple, of sacrifice, of the Levites, of the priesthood, of Aaron, of being the high priest, is set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. Why 
is all this about Melchizedek important? Because God has to send a different, better high priest. Because the system wasn't working. The system did not offer forgiveness for your sins. The system could not save you. And so a new priest who's not from the line of Levi, who doesn't follow that tradition, comes out. And the only order that that priest can come from is this order of Melchizedek because it represents something different, something better. Did you notice that two words at the end, or the beginning of verse 19? And a what kind of hope is introduced? A better hope. A better hope. What is that better hope? That better hope is God sending his son to be born on this earth. That better hope is his son teaching and preaching, performing miracles. That better hope is that son being crucified on a cross and dying for our sins. That better hope is our salvation that is only found in Jesus. He is the better hope. The better hope. And remember, the writer of Hebrews, most likely, this is written during the time when the temple in Jerusalem, Herod's temple, is standing. It's written in the time where there are priests. There's Levites running around, performing sacrifices. It's written when there is a high priest in Jerusalem. It's all there. And what is he saying? There's a better hope. There is a We talked about this in our first week in this series. Most likely, the initial audience for the book of Hebrews are second generation Jewish Christians. And these are Jewish Christians who are living in Israel, most likely around Jerusalem, who are being persecuted. And some of them are thinking to themselves, I can escape persecution if I just go back to Judaism. If I just go back to the temple system, to the high priest, if I just go back to that, then I won't be bothered. I won't be persecuted. I won't be thrown in jail. I won't be killed. Because a lot of the persecution was coming from the Jewish leaders. And the writer of Hebrews is wanting them to know, don't go back to that system because there's something better here for you. But friends, he also wants us to know in 2023 in Colorado Springs, Colorado, there is a better hope for you. His name is Jesus. That's why all this Melchizedek stuff is important. Because there is a better hope for you. When I was a kid, one of my favorite treats was when my mom would make chocolate chip cookies. When a chocolate chip cookie comes right out of the oven, whoo, that is a little taste of heaven, I'm pretty sure. The problem at our house is my mom didn't make them very often. I have two younger brothers, and with the three of us, uh, she could make three dozen cookies, and it would be gone in about three minutes. So she knew as soon as she baked them, they would be gone. But chocolate chip cookies, warm chocolate chip cookies, that was my favorite. Oh, I absolutely loved it. It was so good. Then something happened. You see, my maternal grandmother is from Texas, and most of her family lives in Texas, in North Texas. And one of her sisters in Texas sent her a recipe for cowboy cookies. Now, how many have ever had a cowboy cookie? All right. Evidently, we got some Texas roots here. All right. What is a cowboy cookie? Well, a cowboy cookie, there's different styles of recipes, but the kind that my family would make in Texas, and then we started making, is kind of a hybrid of oatmeal cookie, because it's made with oats, 
but it's also made with chocolate chips. And then they'd also sometimes put in peanut butter chips or butterscotch chips and nuts and enough butter and oil that you had to put two notches on your belt by the time you were done. The first time I ever tasted a cowboy cookie right out of the oven, oh, I forgot all about chocolate chips. That was, for me, better. It was better. Now, if you've had a cowboy cookie, you say, yeah, I still like chocolate chip. That's fine. But the point I'm making is good isn't the end. It's not the end goal for us. You probably know some people who are good people. They're good, right? They try to do good things. They try to live a good life. Maybe they're a good neighbor. They're a good coworker. They're a good friend. They're a good classmate. They're good. They, they say good things. They raise good children. They live a good life. And it's great. It's great to have good people around us. But here's the problem. Good doesn't get us into heaven. Good does not save us from our sins. In over 15 years of church ministry, there has been multiple times where I've had conversations with people after someone dies, and the following will be said by people both in the church and out of the church. Well, I know that person is probably in heaven because they lived a what kind of life? Good life. And you know, a good life, it's good. You're a good person. You make good decisions. You have good finances. You're a good citizen. You're a good community member. That is good. I like to live around good people. But here's the problem with good. Good does not save us from our sins. Good is not what we were created to be on this earth to do. Good is not our goal. We weren't just made to be warm chocolate chip cookies. No, there was a better plan for you. A better plan. And so my challenge for all of us today no matter where you are in your walk of faith. Maybe you're someone that you've attended church your whole life, but you've never really made that commitment to let Jesus be your personal Savior, to have that relationship with Him. Yes, you believe in God, you believe in Jesus, you believe in the Bible, but have you really just said, I want to walk with you. I want to, I want to just live my life for you, Jesus. Because that's, that's the difference between good and better. The difference for me between that chocolate chip cookie and that cowboy cookie. We're not here on this earth to just settle for good. We don't want to just be a good church with people who show up with good days and bad days, with good things to say, with good conversations about the weather. No. We want to be something better, something better. We are here to be something better. And what is that? What is that better that we are here to be? That better is people who point our lives to that cross, that point our lives to that Savior. You know, the temple system, the sacrificial system that Israel had, it wasn't a bad system. God was the one who put that system in place. And yes, it got corrupted over time. It became more about power and politics than it did about worshiping the Lord. But God put that system together. But here's the thing. That system was never meant to be permanent. It was never meant to be an end. It was incomplete because the only way it could be completed, the plan from the very beginning, was that God was going to send someone better, a better high priest, 
a Melchizedek. Someone who would shake up that temple system, who would bring forgiveness that didn't just come through animal sacrifice, but for all of us by one sacrifice, his death on a cross. That's the better that we are about. So my challenge again, as we leave today, don't settle for good. Don't just settle to be good people, drive a good car, get good gas mileage, have a good retirement. Settle for something better. Aim for something better. To be a child of God who has a Savior who died for you, who loves you, who forgives you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have given us so much more than just a good life. That you have given us a Savior. A Savior who gives us the greatest gift, the best gift of forgiveness and brings us close to you. And I know there's probably people today, Lord, who are saying, I don't even have a good life right now. My life's the opposite of good in this moment. I'm really struggling. Lord, I just ask that you would, you would just touch hearts this morning, that your Holy Spirit would work inside people to know that the struggles they're going through, those are insignificant to the promise that you give. Help them to feel that promise, to feel that hope, that better hope that comes through you. And in the season of Lent, Lord, just draw us closer to you. Focus our eyes and our hearts on you through your son, Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.